delighted to take, oh, thank you. So I would be delighted to take some questions. The more personal you make your questions, the more I'm gonna love having a chance to answer it. There's no question out of bounds, there's no question that's inappropriate, and there's no question that I would not love having the opportunity to answer. Um, just a few things that maybe you might be interested in. So now is the portion that we can get more technical. So a lot of you might just have some curiosity about, okay, so you're blind. How do you serve on your state's highest court? How do you get to your state's highest court? How do you do the work of the state's highest court? How do you understand and appreciate a crime scene? How do you understand and appreciate evidence? How do you navigate a courtroom if you can't understand or um, be able to relate to facial expressions? How do you understand evidence? How does any of that work? So a lot of you might have questions about that. And also a lot of you might have some technical questions about, okay, so you've done 25 marathons. How do you do 25 marathons if you're blind? Now, how, what's the technical approach you use to that? How do you get through the marathon course if you can't see where you're going? How do you do an Ironman if you can't see? How do you swim 2.4 miles? How do you ride a bike for 112? How do you run 26.2? How does that all work? And any and all of these things are on the table. And I would just love to be able to talk. And a lot of you are probably going to ask questions about schooling, education. What was it like to go through secondary education? What was it like to go through high school? being blind. We'd we'll like to go through college and law school. Like anything and everything that you guys want to talk about is on the table and I would just be delighted to answer and entertain any questions that anybody has. So I'm going to let uh, guests, uh, do we have like a moderator that can help? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll take care of that. <laughs> All right, I'll um, let the rabbi call on folks and I'm looking forward to the questions. I, uh, I only would like to ask that the people that are here uh, in the room, get a chance to ask questions first. Okay. We'll take some questions also from people online. Uh, people are just writing. I just want you to know um, that this is the most amazing thing that they've ever heard. Oh, uh, someone is writing that they've been crying for the last <laughs> half hour. You're the most inspirational person that they've that they've ever seen. Um, it helps not to know me. Once you know <laughs> me, it really goes downhill unbelievably fast. I, I can't tell you how many people have said to me again and again and again, Please save this live. Please save this live. Please save this live. We've probably had, I think, between uh, 70 and, and, and 90 people uh, on at any specific, any specific moment. Um, so I have a few different questions on the online part. People are saying you're a great example. It was so emotional. Just wow, etc., etc. So let's take some questions from the room, and then we'll take some questions from online. Um, anyone would like to uh, start us off? You're more than welcome. Uh, Jessica. Just say, state your name uh, before you start talking. Okay. So I'm Jessica, and um, we met briefly in the lobby. Yes. Um, what inspired you to become a judge? That's a wonderful question. So I would say that, I'll take you back a little bit before we get to being a judge. What really inspired me to be a lawyer was that notion that, I mean, when you have a disability, people need to have a voice. And I'm just gonna be direct, anyone who's different, right? Like someone like me, I'm just different, right? It's just the way it is, right? I'm blind. You look at me, I'm just different. So I don't fit in to any normal circumstance. So what happens when you're different? You tend to get bullied a little bit, you get picked on a little bit. And I always thought that, you know what? If I could become a lawyer, I could try to make life better for people. I could use the law to have an impact. I could use the law to give people representation who otherwise wouldn't have it. And I'll just tell you kind of a crazy story. So when I was in law school, I actually made a deal with Hashem. It was a cold Chicago winter. I went to Northwestern and I was, it was, I was right on Lake Michigan and it was so cold. And I remember praying to Hashem and I said, you know, Hashem, I don't think I'm going to make it. Like, I don't think I'm going to make it. Because what happens in like law school is, for all of my friends, everything came easy to them. You know, they understood the materials easily, they digested the materials easily, it just wasn't difficult for them. But for me, if it takes you an hour to do something, it takes me five hours to do it. So it's a one to five ratio. So everything just took considerable effort. And even with that, and I just, I always love to share this with people, I graduated in the 10th percentile of my class, 
But what I leave out is it was the bottom 10th percentile. <laughs> so it's a true statement, but people don't usually ask the follow-up, which is which percentile was it? In fact, I think I graduated last. But the thing is, is that for me, it really meant more. Like it meant so much more because I wanted it so desperately. And, you know, I don't really read and write. And, you know, and so what I have to memorize and internalize everything. And so it was just brutal. And, and I remember it was this one Monday night in January and I prayed to Hashem. I said, Hashem, look, I, I really want this. If you give me the opportunity to become a lawyer, I will dedicate my professional career to representing people with disabilities and special needs who otherwise cannot afford legal representation. But you have to allow for me to get through law school and pass the bar to do this. So miraculously, I actually graduated from law school and even more miraculously, I actually passed the bar. And then I went back and I was blessed because my family has a law firm. And I went back and I told my brother and sister and my dad that I was going to start our law firm's public services division and that we were never going to charge for representation on the cases that I took, which is going to allow for us to take cases that no one else will take. But we're going to do them because we are going to make life better for people with disabilities, especially disabled veterans. And we're going to use the practice of law to try to impact people in a positive and powerful way. And my dad used to always joke with people. He would say, you know, my son Richard, he started our pro bono division. And then he'd go on and he'd say, it's our firm's fastest growing area. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it was one of those things that we, we, not only did we not make money on the cases, but we would lose hundreds of thousands of dollars on each case because we wouldn't fee shift. We would, we would, I insisted that we would do it for free because I wanted people to understand that disability rights was a civil right. And that the minute that money gets involved, people don't look at it that way. So as a result, we absorbed all the costs of litigation. But we would take cases and we would fight and these were really David versus <coughs> Goliath struggles. I mean, one of the first cases I had was against the city of Detroit because they were operating buses that had broken wheelchair lifts. And what would happen is, you know, 60% of the fleet was inaccessible for, for wheelchair users. So veterans who needed to get back and forth from hospitals and doctor's appointments or just live their life would spend hours waiting on, you know, bus corners, waiting for a bus to come to pick them up with a, a, a working lift. And that was my first case. And it went on for years. But ultimately, the city did buy all new buses, they retrained the drivers, and this now became, for all intents and purposes, it became the, the benchmark for all public transport providers across the United States. So it was very and, you know, and, and I'll, I, I don't want to belabor the, the, the cases too much, but, but you, just, you just believed in it, right? And it was one of those things, and, and the reason that we can bring Hashem into this a little bit, or a lot, is because I would take these cases, and if you look at it, you would think there's no way that a person could win this case. Because you go up against these, these mammoth defendants, <laughs> and they would all tell me, look, you're like, you know, a blind guy, and you know, we have unlimited resources. And basically what would happen is you'd go into court, and I kid you not, you would have me sitting at a table. It was like pathetic, like by myself, memorizing all the files. And then at the other table, you'd have like eight people at the other table. So you'd walk in, you'd look at the courtroom, and it was just, it was like I was just sitting there by myself at the table, and then the next table had like all these people at it, you know, with their computers and their files and all that kind of stuff. And it was just interesting because, you know, miracles really kind of do happen because in every one of these cases, something remarkable happened to change the trajectory. The, uh, you know, I actually, I used to be um, a professor at the University of Michigan. I used to teach social change. I used to teach poli sci. And I sued the University of Michigan because they wouldn't make the stadium accessible for paralyzed veterans. 
And you had veterans that wanted to go to football games but couldn't go. And it was a huge deterrent to their recovery because they couldn't be a part of the university community because they couldn't go to the stadium. And so this was a many years of litigation, but then the university ultimately rebuilt the stadium, made it fully accessible, and now it's one of the most accessible facilities probably in the world. But what it shows is that not only is it a good thing for the disabled, but it made it better for everybody. And so when you ask, you know, why did I become a lawyer? I just became a lawyer because, you know, honestly, like, I think what happens is, is, is that it's that essence of struggle and that, that, that living with struggle, that it's very painful on a day in and day out basis. But when you look at things in the totality, it gives you an extraordinary life. Like if you live with struggle, you really understand and appreciate life at a different perspective. Because when you live with that struggle, you understand perspective and you live with perspective. And I have to tell you for every single person that's here today, What's important about it is, is, is that for the vast majority of the time that I have to spend, it's difficult, it's hard. Everything is a challenge. Everything has a certain level of pain that comes with it. But what makes life exciting and what ultimately gives it a sense of meaning and excitement and inspiration is the totality. You can never look at your life in a snapshot. You can have a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, a bad year. And that's how most of us live. But what you tend to find is within that parameter of time, there's going to be certain experiences or certain things that you're going to come to know. And they could be fleeting. But what happens is it makes it all worth it. It makes it totally meaningful. When you say to yourself, oh my God, you see it in a totality. And when you see it in a totality, you say, oh my God, life is about experiences. Life isn't really about objects or things. Life really comes down to two things. It really comes down to relationships and experiences. And the more experiences you have, and candidly, the people that have the greatest struggles in life, you know, especially health challenges, they usually, without question, their lives are so much more rich. They're so much more intense. And they're so much more meaningful because it's really life at its core that when you live with struggle, it's just you feel it and you experience it and you embrace it, but you feel the power and the intensity and the majesty of life in a way that folks that don't have to live it that way will never be able to understand or really be able to consummate or appreciate. So I really became a lawyer for that reason to basically take on those challenges and to take on those fights and to get involved in those battles. And they weren't easy and they were definitely intensive. But in the end, you can actually see that the world was made better. And now if you go to the airport and you see people with disabilities flying, you know, that wasn't just something that just automatically happened. We had to fight for that. That was a case I worked on for years to get US aviation to provide accessible ways for people to travel, to build airports in a manner that could be used by everyone, to have staffing that's trained. They didn't always just have that. That had to be fought for. All of these things had to be fought for. But now what's exciting is when you see people in one circumstance where it was seen as being extraordinary, to see a severely disabled person on a bus or on a plane or at a movie or at a job, that at one time was seen as this extraordinary thing. Nowadays, it just comes off as being ordinary. Success is reached when the extraordinary becomes the ordinary. Okay, our next question, please. Amazing, yes. Okay, so this is a very like deep question, please. actually, concerning uh, discrimination against people with disabilities, such as yourself, Okay. Uh, me as well, but okay. obviously. Um, speaking of discrimination, systemic discrimination, aka baseless hatred, um, meaning sinat kinam, meaning like not hatred, hatred, but like systemic hatred, okay. meaning haters gonna hate. Mm -hmm. How did you how did you react to that at first? How did you acclimate to it? And the fact that people didn't want to be your friends because of that, because of how it affected them. 
how your disability affected them, right. or how whether or not they were patient with you or not, et cetera, et cetera, or whether they understood your disability or not? That's a beautiful question. So the way I would answer your question is to say, and, and, and I think this is important, I can only speak for myself, right? Every disabled person has their own story. Everyone has their own life experience that kind of makes them the person that they are. So I can only speak to my experience and to my story. First off, I wanna use a quote from the United States Census Department. 85% of the blind community is currently unemployed. And that's not because they're not talented, it's not because they're not driven, it's not because they're not smart, it's not because they're not capable. The reason that 85% of the blind community is unemployed is socioeconomic. And I'm just gonna lay it on the table I came from a family where we had resources. My family was able to provide resources. The best education, the best counselors, the best teachers, the best of everything. I had everything. And the reason I share that is because if I hadn't been given those advantages, there is absolutely no doubt that I would be part of the 85% that's currently unemployed. The only reason that I'm different is socioeconomic benefits that I was given. If I hadn't been given those benefits from the family that I came from, I am absolutely certain I would be part of the 85% who is currently unemployed. Having said that, the reason that I am so passionate about what I do and the reason that I care so deeply about it is because usually, and this is an oversimplification, but usually people fit into two categories. Category A, which are people that live with discrimination, live with prejudice, live with hardship, but don't have the means or the resources to effectuate change. Then there's category B, which are people that really don't live with that level of hardship or discrimination or difficulty and have tremendous resources. So as a result, they don't have a real understanding or appreciation of conceptually what it means to struggle. The reason that I am so excited about my situation and my circumstance is because I get to have both. I get to live with challenge and hardship, but at the same time, I have the resources and opportunity to try to effectuate change and do something about it. Now, I want to take you back, if I could, to your question, which I think is just an excellent question. So I would have to say, I think a lot of it is how we relate and how we connect with people. The thing you can probably tell about me is I love people. I live for people. My life is all about people. The reason that COVID was so difficult for someone like myself was that inability to be around people was a death sentence for me. The way that I appreciate life is people. The way that I understand life is people. There's nothing that I can do that doesn't involve people. So I just have a love of people. I have a need to be around people, to be with people, to connect with people, to be close with people. It's really my essence of who I am. Now the reason I'm giving you a kind of a long answer to a beautiful question is because when you talk about discrimination, in order for me to have the position that I have, to serve on the highest court of the state of Michigan, just to explain kind of how the logistics work, there are seven justices on the Supreme Court of the great state of Michigan. There are 800 judges that are below us. So in order to serve on the state's highest court, we stand for election. So I am elected to this position. I am not appointed. I am elected by the voters on a statewide basis. There are 11 million people who live in my state. For me to have this seat and occupy this position, I've got to convince millions of people that I should be the person that should represent them in this capacity. The reason that I share that with you is I am blind. This had never been done before. And people questioned what would happen if you put a blind person on a statewide ticket. The reason I want to share this is because people, I believe, need to become more optimistic. People have got to become more idealistic. People have got to just start feeling better about each other. 
and about our country. And the reason I say that is, you have a blind guy, a blind person, running to serve on the highest court of the state of Michigan. And for years, just to take you back, to kind of explain the significance of this, taking you back a number of years, what would usually happen with people that were born with severe disabilities is they would become wards of the state and they would live in institutions. And the idea was that they should be removed from society. They should live amongst the other, out of sight, out of mind, because that is what's best for them. But we made incredible progress. Change takes time. But if you stick with it, it can be real and it can be profound and it can be lasting. Do you know what happened when they opened the first group home in the state of Michigan? When they moved people from institutionalization into neighborhoods and opened the first group home? Do you know what happened to those group homes when they were in different neighborhoods across the state? They got firebombed because people were so scared of having people who were different living in their neighborhood. But I share you this story so you can be inspired and realize we don't think that way anymore. And that change came. Nowadays, of course, you have group homes and you have independent living facilities and you have people living all across the states. Now you have people in workplaces. You have people on buses and trains, on airplanes. You have people that are fully integrating into society and into the world. They're welcomed and embraced. Now, it's not perfect. There's always going to be some challenges. But for the most part, we have to celebrate how far we've come. And I want to kind of end your question with this principle. People asked, what would happen if you have a blind person run for office on a statewide basis? It's one thing to have people with disabilities living in your neighborhood. It's one thing to have people with disabilities going to your workplace or riding on your bus. But it's a whole different thing to have people with disabilities serving in a position where they are going to make decisions that affect able-bodied people. You know, this was the test. Would people in the state of Michigan be comfortable having a disabled person not be their equal, but be in a position where they are going to make determinations and decisions that are going to affect them. And do you know what the answer was? A resounding yes. Not only was the state of Michigan okay with it, they embraced it. And as I would travel across the state and go from city to city and town to town and meet with every newspaper, television station, radio station across the state, the answer to your question goes like this. If you can allow for people to feel comfortable, the slogan of my campaign was blind justice, which is the most corny slogan you could possibly come up with. But what it did was it allowed for people to ask questions. It allowed for people to assuage their concerns. If somebody didn't ask you a question because they were too concerned about political correctness that they weren't going to ask, they would never vote for you because they didn't have their doubts remedied. But if people would ask you the hard questions, and if people could be honest and feel that they could approach you and ask you questions that you wouldn't take offense to, but that you could answer their concerns about how you could perform and do this job, the people that were usually the biggest doubters became your biggest supporters. It's all about how we relate to people. It's all about how we connect with people, and it's all about how we respect people. And if people feel a connection to you and you feel a connection to them, if people feel that you respect them and, you res and they respect you, and if people feel that openness and they feel that genuineness and you're able to embrace and have a connection, anything is possible. We won this election by 10 points, 10 points. And I think what it really comes down to is the fact that I think that with all the difficulties that we're going through right now, I think we have to remember that people are good and that people are kind 
And I'll just say one other thing, and I think it's very important. I think it is absolutely critical, and I apologize if this might come off being too direct or possibly controversial. We must absolutely come back to being in person. It has to happen. We must be in person. We cannot use Zoom. You can use Zoom as an accessory. You can use Zoom as a complement, and that's completely fine. But the key is, is that we have to focus on going back to work. We have to focus on going back to our offices. We have to focus on being a community again. Because quite candidly, community is life and life is community. And one of the things that really is critical about what I see in the courts is I am incredibly impassioned about this like you cannot believe. The courts must be in Pearson. They must be in person. Because when you have meetings, and when you have discussions and you do it exclusively by Zoom, you might think that that's efficient. And what happens to people with disabilities happens to us first, but it's followed by everybody else. We're the canary in the coal mine. We can tell you how something's gonna go, if it's gonna work and if it's not. And I can tell you unabashedly, Zoom does not work. And we can have debates and discussions about it, but I will tell you over time, you're going to find that it does not work. And the reason it doesn't work is because it is important when you're working with people, when you're worshiping with people, when you're friends with people, when you're relating to people, when you go on a Zoom conference call for work, you don't do certain things. You don't ask people, how are you doing? I heard your dad is sick. I heard your mom is struggling. I heard your kid just got bar mitzvah. I heard this, I heard that. Those conversations matter because that's what gives us joy as people. That's what goes to our humanity as people. And I can tell you at the courts, when you don't have those conversations, when you don't have those interactions, people forget why they like each other. They forget that they're friends with each other. They forget that they care about each other. You have to have things in person. In person must not be the exception, it must be the rule. Now there's always gonna be circumstances and situations where people need to use Zoom, or there's always a circumstance or situation where somebody doesn't feel comfortable being in person, and accommodations can always be made for that. But the key is, is that we must make the default in person. And we must come back together, and we must make that our priority. Okay, next question. Rabbi. Your Honor. Yes. You said how your uh, challenges, your experiences have formed you into the incredible person that you are today. Um, if you could go back and change anything about your journey, how would you and why? That's a great question. I think that everybody is always going to live with doubts. And to answer your question, I'm going to answer it from a judicial kind of perspective. I'm gonna answer it by saying that every judge, when they make a decision, always thinks about their decision. Always does. And I'll go back, I know what your question's getting at, but I wanna answer it from more of a judicial philosophy and then go back and answer it kind of from more of a life philosophy. But as a judge, any judge that says to you, oh, I am confident about every decision I make, should never be a judge. You should be tormented by your decisions. You should agonize over your decisions. For candidly, no human being should really be making these decisions about what happens to another. I mean, you have to realize every single day, I have to make decisions that affect people's entire life. It affects their freedom. Is someone gonna spend the rest of their life in prison or not? You know, is, uh, is, is a company gonna owe the state $3 billion or is it not? Are we gonna have police, you know, if, if, you, if you rule certain ways on, on a simple tax case that's worth $3 billion? You know, you know, you have to look at what that means for the taxpayer and you have to look at that what that means for city services and the tax codes. Is a mother gonna ever see her child again because of the charges that are pending? You know, you, you know should, should, how do you use water? How do you use resources? All of these issues are things that basically come to us every single day on the court. And when you make a decision, you do the best that you can, 
But I think the challenge is, is, is that when you put yourself in this situation, the thing that always concerns me is I believe that Hashem is going to hold you accountable in a higher manner. So if you choose to run for this position where you're making these types of decisions, you have to accept that for all intents and purposes, you're going to be responsible when your life comes to a conclusion and you're going to be forced to have to look at every decision you made. And I think the biggest challenge that I'm going to face as I kind of move into the afterworld is you're going to be faced with that challenge of being shown what could have been. Had you done this, this would have happened. Had you not done that, this would have happened. And I have a feeling the most painful thing that I'm going to have to go through is seeing what could have been instead of realizing what was. So I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those situations that, you know, you ponder every single day. But then I say to myself, you know what? I look at things, I look at decisions I made, I look at things that have happened, and I say to myself, okay, you know what? Hopefully I did the best that I could. But here's the catch. Then there are certain cases that I've had a chance to decide, and certain cases I've had a chance to write opinions for. And this is just one case out of many, but there was one case that just, there's always cases that just kind of stick with you. And I get a number of these cases, unfortunately. And one of these cases that I tend to focus in on are wrongful convictions. And there was a case that I wrote the opinion for where basically you had two young men that had spent 18 years in prison for murder and they were innocent of the charges. Wow. But they had spent 18 years in prison. And the reason that this job is worth it, right? The reason you make sacrifices to do this job. You know, just very quick, I'll share with you how it works. Every Wednesday in Lansing, we have what's called conference. Conference is when you decide what the court's gonna do with the cases that exist before you. So the seven justices and the two commissioners gather in conference, and we ultimately make decisions on the cases that are before us. Now there's usually 25 cases every Wednesday that we're responsible for. And just to give you a sense of how it works, people say, well, do you put those cases into Braille? And the answer is no, you can't. Because if I'm trying to review a month long murder case, there's no way that you can take a transcript from a month long murder case and inscribe it into Braille. If I give you one textbook page, you're gonna give me 65 Braille pages. Wow. So it doesn't work, right? So Braille's just not an option. So then the second thing people say is, okay, if you can't use Braille, can you use a computer? Well, computer doesn't work because if I'm listening to the computer, I'm not able to interact with the justices. I've got six people I've gotta convince of my position. And so if I'm not able to interact with those folks, it's like I'm not even there. There's, the, it, there's no purpose to me being there. So you can't use a computer because you have to have that interaction. So the only option that's left is I memorize all 25 cases every single week. Now here's the deal. I don't memorize them word for word because that's not possible. There's no way you can memorize the cases word for word. But what I do do is I learn all of the legal elements that have to be decided of each case. So any, because the case is being brought up on a, a certain legal theory. So I will learn the specifics of that case to such a degree as it pertains to the area of law that has to be rendered a decision on. And then what will happen is the commissioner will say, justices, we are now on case 18. Case 18, is a carjacking on Woodward Avenue that resulted in two homicides. Now when I hear carjacking resulting in two homicides, that triggers the case in its entirety. But we're not done. It's a common law system. So what does that mean? You can't just say to your colleagues, colleagues, this is a trial that needs to be overturned. This is a conviction that needs to be relooked at. This is a case that needs to go back to the trial court. 
you can't just do that. You have to present an argument for why you feel that way. So you have to use all the common law cases that are relevant. So you're gonna have common law cases that work for you, and you're gonna have common law cases that work against you. So the key is that you have to know all the common law cases that support your position, and then you have to know all the common law cases that you distinguish that aren't relevant to your position or work against you to make your argument. But here's what matters, right? I ran for this position. I asked the people of the state of Michigan to afford me with this opportunity. Nobody cares that you're blind. It doesn't matter. And I'll tell you something really interesting. Going back to the wonderful question that was posed about discrimination. This is where discrimination really does come into the fold. If I had to go in front of a judicial selection committee and I didn't get to run for this position, I would never be a Supreme Court justice. If I had to go in front of a merit selection and make my argument to a group of people as to why I should be a justice, there is no chance that I'd be a Supreme Court justice. Because what would happen is the people on the committee would say, oh, he is so inspiring. And wow, what a great story. But when it comes to them voting as to whether or not you should be appointed to this position, we all know what happened. They would say, let's go with the safer option. Let's go with someone who looks like us, who sounds like us, who relates to us. Let's go with someone that basically isn't gonna be seen as a risk. But the voters are different. When you go directly to the people, they actually know better. And they're kinder and they're more willing to give someone a chance because they can relate to it within their own lives and their families' lives and their friends' lives and their community's lives. So in answering your question, do I have regrets or do I wish that things had been different? Absolutely. But then I look at certain cases and I look at a number of cases where people who were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole are free because their innocence was revealed, because it was shown that what they had been saying for years and years and years was true. They, in fact, were innocent. And there's something really powerful about when you sign off on an order and you write an opinion, and once that opinion gets voted on, and gets filed, a person can walk out of prison that minute. In fact, they're required to. The minute that you send out an opinion, the Department of Corrections is required to release that person immediately. In fact, they create sometimes issues because you have people that are like way up in the Upper Peninsula far from their families and they have to be, they have to be released. So sometimes the court will you know, give exemption to allow for you know, them to make sure that they are released in such a way that you know, they're not just stranded in the Upper Peninsula somewhere. <laughs> but the thing is, is, is that that's the power of this position. <clears throat> and that's what makes it meaningful. And so when I answer your question, and I, I look at it from this perspective, that if these things hadn't happened, and you can not had to go through these issues, or these challenges, or these things, these people would probably still be in prison. So when you can look at the fact that something really has come out of it that's powerful and meaningful and significant. You know, one of the other decisions that I had a chance to write was a decision that affected the people of Flint, Michigan. And as for many of you are probably familiar, Flint is the area that had issues with the water. And I was able to write the decision that affected those folks' rights as it pertained to the water. And it's just one of those things where I think in life, you always have to kind of remember this, is, is that there's a long road and the days are hard and most days are not so great. But then all of a sudden, something really remarkable happens when you kind of least expect it that can be transformative and can be impactful and can have a really significant effect. And I think sometimes it's the one day out of many that kind of makes everything worthwhile. So I'm not sure what our time sequence is. I, I'll take some more questions, but um, I'm going to let you decide, Rabbi, what our time is. Yes, that was like. amazing. I just want to read you a couple of the comments. Oh, sure. <laughs> and then we'll take the question that was waiting. Okay. Um, 
Number one, the first one was from Joanna Alexis. I don't have any public questions. I have a four-year-old who's blind, and I just want to say thank you for sharing your story. You're in a true inspiration. But I'm going to do something. Yeah. I'm going to give everybody my phone number because I like to be accessible. So anybody <laughs> should take down this phone number because I really, really mean it. Like, I believe that if you're going to be in positions like this, you should be open and accessible to everybody. This is my cell phone number. So this comes right to me. It doesn't go through the court. It doesn't go to my office. If you call this number, you're actually going to get me directly. And anyone should feel free to please use it and call me for any questions or things that you want to talk about. Now, the only question I'm going to make is, is that it might take me like a day or two to get back with you because I do get a lot of calls and my caseload can be pretty intense. So if I don't call you back right away, just kind of give it like a day or two and I promise I will get back with you. My phone number, and anyone can take this down and call me at any time for any reason, this is my personal cell number, 248-866-2959, 248-866-2959. But I do ask, you know, just please be kind of understanding that I, I will do my best to get back but just always understand that my days are like 15, 16 hours. And so I, but, but the great thing about it is when I get to the end of the day, I always kind of check to see if I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Okay, did we have a, uh, another question? Let me just oh. finish with this. I wanted to read you this. Oh. Uh, as well, uh, many, many, many people have asked the same uh, iteration of the same question. Uh, they said, it, are, is this person human? <laughs> and uh, what and they were say and what they were saying I think is communicating is of many different versions of it was how in the world does uh, did you manage to get this outlook on life did you have to work on this outlook as hard as you had to work on training for the marathon <laughs> were you born with this emuna like where where does where does anyone never mind a person with any challenges but where does anyone get this level of emuna, of positivity, of hope, of faith in the future. Um, that's their question, and I'm, I'm just, I, you know, I'm only kind of saying it because, uh, you know, as a rabbi, I am in awe of your emuna. I'm sure Rabbi Mizrahi will concur. It's, uh, it's something from another planet. So where are you I from? I think a lot of people <laughs> probably think I'm from another planet. So, like, a lot of people that know me are like, oh, yeah, he's definitely, they won't give an argument with that. He's definitely from another planet. <laughs> I, I think that a lot of it really does come from within the home. I think the key is, in many situations, is the attitudes that are given to you by your parents and, you know, the attitude that your family creates for you. And I think that, that what it is, is, is that, you know, and, and yeah, sometimes when you're really idealistic or optimistic or really energetic or really enthusiastic, people will sometimes make fun of you or they'll tease you or they'll say that, you know, you don't live in reality. But I think that it really comes back to this. I, I really think it's so... I just think it really comes back to our life experiences. And I, and I think that, you know, I've come to realize that at this phase in life, you know, the life experiences that I was blessed with, you know, why would Hashem not, why would he give these experiences to you but for to do something? You know what I'm saying? It's like now when you have a life where you've had so many experiences, that what happens is you have all these experiences, good and bad, but with experience comes the ability to really do some extraordinary things. And I just wanna kinda of answer the question by saying this, because I love that we have so many young people that are kinda of with us today. And I, and I wanna kind of you know, use our last remaining minutes to really talk directly to them. And perhaps, I love the synagogue, I'm here in New York all the time, and so perhaps we could do some other events. And I would, oh, me. <laughs> and I would be honored to do it. And hopefully maybe we could do some events that really focus on the students or the young people. And this is something, and maybe we could do this as a teaser for the young people. But I think that this is the thing, like when you kind of talk about the spirit, I, I think for me, really what it comes in is this, is there is a certain blessing that comes from being blind. 
And the blessing, that, not that you'd want it, not that you'd wish it upon yourself or anybody else, but I get to see the absolute best side of people every day. You see only the best. You never see the bad. You see only the good in people. Imagine like spending all, because that's the thing about blindness is people can empathize. They understand it. They can relate to it. It doesn't have to be explained to them. There's so many other disabilities that are hidden disabilities, meaning that you have to explain it. The more you have to explain to people, the harder it is for them to comprehend or understand what it is. But blindness is pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy. People see you. They understand you're blind. They get what you can and can't do. And as a result, they want to help you. And how great is life where basically you can spend every day seeing the absolute best in people, having people help you, having people come over to you to guide you, having people showing warmth and kindness and compassion. Basically, because of my disability, I see the absolute best side in humanity every single day. I see the absolute best in people. And there's just no better way to live life than seeing the good in people because I'm forced to. I can't live in isolation. I can't live without people like we were talking about before. I have to be with people. So what does that require? It requires that you have to interact with folks constantly and you get to interact with people in the warmest and most beautiful of ways. But I want to say, and that's where I think you get your spirit and your soul is from that positive interaction. But I want to end with this because I think this is really important, especially to the young folks that are out there, to the people that are in high school or the people that are in middle school. I want to share something with you that I wish people had shared with me as I was going through this. I hated high school. I just hated it. And the reason I want to share that is, is because sometimes, you know, when, when, when people are going through a very difficult time, they don't need to hear how much you loved it. They don't need to hear how great you thought it was. They don't need to hear that. The vast majority of people that are going through high school right now are having a hard time and they're struggling and they're trying to find their place and they feel that they don't fit in and they feel as though however they are socially in high school is going to be how they're going to be for the rest of their life. And I was without question the least cool person you're going to possibly find. <laughs> and this is the thing that I want to share with the young folks, and perhaps we'll come back and do it in person and do this more, but this is something I really want to share with them. In life, you have to take it phase by phase, because that's what life is, it's all phases. And in certain phases, there are some people that that phase is just gonna be a difficult phase. And so often what parents do when they have a young person that's going through a hard time is they try to get them to capitulate to the phase. They try to get them to fit in. They try to get them to be cool, to be popular, to do what you can to kind of, you know, succumb to that phase. And I think that I would just want to share with people that are really having a hard time because of whatever circumstance they're in, but especially for people that are going through secondary education that really haven't found their place, that haven't fit in, and really don't know how to fit in. I was in that same circumstance. I had that same exact situation and I had that feeling every day. The key to it is this, just get through it. Don't change who you are. Don't modify who you are to kind of do the best you can to try to fit in, to be accepted, this or that. Sometimes in life, the best thing you can do is just get through it. Try to make the best of the situation right? Like take what you can that's positive and cherish that, right? Do what you can to make it as positive as you can. But for some people in some phases of life, especially high school, this isn't your time. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I want to tell you, here's the thing. Your time comes. Your time comes in ways that you can't even imagine or can't even expect. And I believe that Hashem is giving you this experience, making it so that you're not fitting in, making it so that you're struggling, making it so that, you know, waking up in the morning is hard. But he's giving you this as a challenge. 
because he wants you to have an understanding and an appreciation of challenge. And he wants you to understand and appreciate the concept of struggle because you have no idea what Hashem has in store for you. It is always the people that struggle the most through the early phases of life that are the people who are chosen to have the greatest impact and greatest effect on the world that we know it. So for those of you who are struggling today, understand that you are needed tomorrow. You are needed in ways that you can't even begin to imagine or comprehend. But you are needed because humanity is not only waiting, but counting on you. Thank you all for coming. If you have individual questions, I'm happy to stay after and talk with you individually. And people should feel free to contact me whenever they would like. And hopefully we will see you back here at the synagogue for as many opportunities as possible, especially with the young people. God bless you all. Thank you so much. What an unbelievable, what an unbelievable, unbelievable zechut it has been to have this man here with us today. I, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, I was listening to what you were saying, and when you mentioned Yaakov Avinu, I kept thinking, you know, when Yaakov has that fight, he fights with an angel. And I was just thinking that the person that's standing here with us is in some sort of fight because he can't figure out if he's a human being or if he's an actual angel. And uh, the, the stuff that came out of, your out of your mouth, I just thought to myself, we not only have to save this, but we also have to uh, chop it up into little bits and pieces <laughs> and send it out to people. Each bit is like with its own title <laughs> phrase. It's, it was, I mean, for, for, kids in, for kids in school, for people with disabilities, for people with challenges, to understand the nature of empathy, to understand the concept uh, of justice. It was so, so special. And I just want to share one thing with you. There's a fellow I know, his name is uh, Lavi Greenspan. Oh, of course, yes. Lavi is a dear friend. Of course, of course. And Lavi, Lavi cannot see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I took my children and we went to his house. Mm -hmm. And he was feeding us, I don't even understand how he was doing this. He's a remarkable <laughs> man. And he's feeding us, literally, he's making us food from his refrigerator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And make a bracha like this, and why don't we go get this? And he, he took us to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I'm not joking. We got in the car. He said, okay, you have two more streets. Without, I don't understand how he was seeing what was going on. But he knew exactly where we were, navigated. And then he, he refused to allow me even to buy, bought uh, the kids Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> we get back. We're having a great time. He goes to the bathroom, and he comes out of the bathroom. And he turns around and he makes the bracha that you make when you come out of the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And he turns around to the wall so that he's facing the wall when he makes it, like in complete and utter concentration. Mm -hmm. And he makes the bracha and I started crying. Because <laughs> the bracha is that you make after you go to the bathroom is um, chalulim, chalulim, you know, uh, things that are supposed to be open. Uh, if they didn't stay open, what would be? Mm -hmm. Things that are supposed to be closed, mm -hmm. if they didn't stay closed, what mm -hmm. would be? And the whole middle of this blessing is literally all about things working. Mm. And he's making this bracha, <laughs> and he ends the bracha, Baruch Ata Hashem, right? Rofech ol basar how God heals all flesh, um and does all these wondrous things. <laughs> and I was just crying, thinking, how is this man making this blessing? How can he make a blessing that God does wondrous things with the body, <laughs> open and shut and etc etc and and I asked him that question because he like you like yourself is so open and wants to hear and he answered me he says well I have to thank God for bodies that work and for eyes that work mm -hmm. I can't survive without eyes that work now mm -hmm. maybe they're not my eyes <laughs> but if someone else can't see how can I see mm -hmm. so I think of other people and he would not say this because he is <gasps> nearly as humble as you. You know, only someone as remarkable as, uh, as Judge Richard Bernstein right over here could say that the only way that he succeeded in life was because he was born into a, a good socioeconomic background. This is a man who's a champion in every area of his life. It doesn't take uh, riches to run the Iron Man. And that level of determination, of strength, of willpower has nothing to do with, uh, with the home that you were raised in. That's all down to you, but you're too <laughs> humble to say otherwise. So I thought of another answer, 
um, which spoke to the humility that he has and that you have. And I said, Baruch Ata Hashem, maybe what he is saying is, Blessed are you Hashem, Rofechol Basar, you heal all flesh. Kama. Kama. And for those who you deem that the best thing for them is that their flesh should not become healed, Mafli mm-hmm. La'asot, you make them into such wondrous <laughs> creations. You are a wondrous creation. Oh, thank you, you are one, not in a million, that's not good enough, you're one in a billion. <laughs> we are so grateful that you were here with us tonight. Thanks. So grateful that the people uh, online have been able to hear this and see this. We most definitely will have you again. I kept thinking to myself, you know, I got to get him to come again for people who are starting university. And then I thought, I got to get him to come again for people who are in schools. And then I thought, I got to get him to come again for people who struggle with, you know, academic challenges or, or who don't think they can make it in life. You are a panacea. You are a cure-all. Um, you have healed a great many of us tonight. Oh. And uh, we are so grateful that you were here with us. Thank you, Rabbi. God bless. Thank you. That's so kind. Thank you.